Hello, 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 and welcome to another exciting Circus Stream webinar. It's great to see so many people here already waiting to join in. Super excited to be here today hosting this webinar alongside some very special guests here. Uh, but as always, before I do continue on, I would love to see if you can all hear me and see me. So please let me know in the chat if you can hear me and see me. I see a bunch of hellos and yeses. Uh, hello, hello, hi. So we've got David. Hello, yes, we hear you and see you. Rebecca, uh, Janice, Pam, lovely, awesome. Great to see that everyone can hear me and see me. Super excited to be hosting this webinar here today uh, alongside uh, Jeremy Dalton, our very special guest for joining us today. And uh, great to see so many people currently tuning in. As with all of our uh, webinars here at Circus Stream, I love to ask, where are you all currently tuning in from? I see Simon or Simon. Hello from Peru. Welcome. Carrie from Toronto. Andrew, Los Angeles. Oh, we're going too quick now. Vancouver, France, San Jose, New Mexico, London, Czech Republic, UK. Woo! Quite an international crowd today. Super excited. I myself am located in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Uh, we, we had a big dump of snow, you know, yesterday, a couple days ago. So winter is not over for us here in Canada. But I do see Medellin, Colombia, San Antonio, Ireland as well. Welcome, Colin, from Ireland. Vancouver, Arizona, Berenice from Germany, and David from England. Lovely to have you all join us here today. Um, as with all of our workshops and webinars, this is recorded. So no matter where you are in the world, please don't worry if you do have to tune out or sign out early. We will record this webinar and share it with everyone who had registered today. So no worries. You know, if you're waking up in the morning, need to have breakfast, Go have that breakfast. If you've got to go to bed or you had a long day, no worries. Do your thing. Swapnil from India, I see in, in the chat there. Welcome. So it looks like all of you are familiar with the chat tab. Now, some house, other housekeeping items beside the chat tab. To the right, under the chat at the bottom, if it's all the same for everyone, there is a questions tab. If you have any questions, please put them in the questions tab. It allows myself, the team backstage, Jeremy today, to really see and organize what questions have come in, what we haven't answered, and what to answer towards the very end of this webinar here. So again, you have the chat tab. Feel free to mingle amongst yourselves, toss in your LinkedIn profiles, do whatever. Uh, but the questions tab, please toss in your questions in the questions tab so we can get to them at the very end of this webinar here. I already see David Jumo. Is this reality or Memorex? He's gotten used to the questions tab. Now, beside the questions tab, there is a polls tab as well. So I'm gonna toss in polls just to gauge the experience of the audience, maybe ask some questions. So feel free to navigate to that polls tab right now. I'm gonna toss in a poll just to ask you all, what industry are you interested in? And when I say what industry are you interested in, I'm curious to know, uh, you know, are you working with metaverse technologies at the moment or VR, AR, and XR? If so, what industries are you looking to apply this to or are you applying this to at the moment? So that's in the polls tab. Please check out the polls tab. Looks like we've got a few answers here already. Education is currently taking the, the lead. Oh, yeah, medical healthcare, gaming, software, IT, design, UI, UX. You can apply this technology, both metaverse technologies, VR and AR, to so many different industries. And that's why I'm super excited to have, as you can all see here, Jeremy here joining us today to really share his insights, not only about Reality Checkbook, which is a great, great read to help you understand more about XR for business and metaverse technologies, but also sharing his insights on um, on. You know, what can you do with XR and metaverse technology? So, Jeremy, hello. It's great to have you here jo joining Hi, us. Steph. Yeah, wonderful to be here. And hi, everyone. I've been enjoying uh, in the background seeing where everyone's from. Super exciting to have such a uh, diverse audience from all around the world. And definitely. Uh, love to see it. No, thank you for joining us, Jeremy. So one thing, Jeremy, that I forgot to mention to you earlier, um, sometimes, you know, there, there are the pop-up sounds that can be heard. So on top of the chat there, there's a little bell notification, mute all notifications. Feel free to click that 
sometimes if it's when it is muted others can't hear it if it's not it might come out through the computer there so just wanted to let you know perfect so let's continue on with this webinar super excited a little introduction about myself my name is stefan i lead partnerships here at circuit stream i have over several years of experience in the tech industry working with travel it companies learning management system providers ERP and business integration platforms. And now in the wonderful world of the metaverse and extended reality, augmented reality, virtual reality, and mixed reality. Now, little icebreaker fact about myself, and I know David Jumo, uh, <laughs> you've, you've been to so many of these webinars already. Uh, I was a member of Water Polo Canada back in the day. I trained with the 2008 Beijing Olympic team. Never went to the Olympics, great experience nonetheless, but I did use my aquatic and swimming skills to save a drowning couple in Mexico. They were taken out by the current. I saw them, went in, uh, got the lady, pulled her in, lifeguard joined me to get the other folk. Um, but, you know, great skills to learn. Let me know if you've heard of water polo in the chat here. Would love to see uh, who has heard of water polo. It's not a popular sport, but always great to see if someone has. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I am honored and it's a pleasure to have Jeremy Dalton join us today on this webinar. Uh, Jeremy himself leads Price Waterhouses or PwC's Metaverse Technologies team, uh, helping clients implement virtual reality, augmented reality, metaverse technologies, and other virtual world technologies um, with you know, their clients and teams around the world. Now, Jeremy is also the author of Reality Check, How Immersive Technologies Can Transform Your Business, a book that anyone can pick up to better understand how VR and AR are being used in businesses all over the world. So it's a pleasure and an honor to have Jeremy join us and I'll invite him to speak in, uh, in about 10 minutes or so after some quick introductions here. So thanks again for joining us, Jeremy. My pleasure. I will, uh, I'll jump back in Steph when you're ready. Otherwise I'll of just course. be a, a sore sight in the background. <laughs> never, never, <laughs> but yes, feel free to hop off or you can stay on no worries. I'll, I'll let you know when to, when to join me. But with that, for those of you who are interested in checking out Jeremy Dalton's book, Reality Check, I invite you to go to the link here, realitycheckxr.com. Again, it's really about finding out how VR and AR are benefiting organizations and individuals and professionals all over the world and how you today can take advantage of this. Now, we are doing a giveaway with about 10 copies of this book, and we will be announcing the winners next Tuesday by email. So do stay tuned for that email to come in, and we will be announcing the winners uh, by email. Now, a little bit about today's agenda. Again, we'll be touching opportunities in and with XR with Jeremy Dalton. Now, for those of you who are new to Circus Stream, I'm gonna introduce you to who is Circus Stream? What does Circus Stream do? Then I'll quickly touch up on the XR industry, an overview of it and the trends that we're seeing and what the future looks like. Then this is gonna be a nice leeway into Jeremy Dalton where I'll invite him on stage to touch more about his book, Reality Check, his approaches, as well as XR opportunities. Now, uh, after, you know, the, this beginning or kind of after the middle part, which should take about 30 to 45 minutes uh, after my intro and Jeremy speaks, you know, if you're interested in building for the metaverse and, you know, learning XR skills, I'll share some resources and some more about our programs here, and then we'll open it up for a live Q&A session at the very end. Now, again, this is all recorded, so do not worry if you have to hop off. If you're having issues with your computer, we're going to send the recording out to everyone who registered here today. We'll post it on YouTube as well. Uh, so don't worry. Again, no matter where you are in the world, if you've got to wake up in the morning, if you've got to go to bed, if you've got a meeting coming up, we've got you. We'll send you those recordings to work with afterwards. So a little bit about Circus Stream. Who is Circus Stream? What is Circus Stream? Well, Circus Stream was founded in 2015 when we identified a gap in the demand for education relating to AR and VR. And our goal has always been to share a foundation of knowledge on the best tools, processes, and workflows for Unity, as well as XR design and development. And to date, we've helped over 40,000 learners develop these highly sought after technical skills. 
Now, what we have here at Circus Stream is a global team of industry experts who are passionate about accelerating the augmented reality and virtual reality industry through education. And we have team members and instructors all over the world, which helps us accommodate students across multiple time zones and geographies. Now, Circus Stream is also a Unity training and channel partner, and partners are approved based on their expertise, focus on quality education, and on the demonstrated success of their students. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Unity, they've created one of the most extensive and robust development engines on the market, which we'll shed more light on very shortly. And our instructors, not to mention, maintain the highest level of certifications offered by Unity. Now, let me make sure everything is all good here still. Yes, people are sharing their LinkedIn profiles. Awesome. I love to see that. But with Circus Stream, we are here to help people get the skills to be able to develop and design virtual reality and augmented reality experiences for any devices out there. And if you're interested, and I'll touch up more of this at the end of the presentation, we have an XR development course, more technical, 10 weeks long, beginner friendly. Uh, this one begins uh, towards the, if I'm not mistaken, May, uh, May, June. Similarly, we have our XR interaction design and prototyping program. This is more design focused, UX focused, 10 weeks as well, beginner friendly. And for those of you really looking to get a career as a metaverse creator, a Unity developer, we have a Unity Developer Bootcamp, 24 weeks long, with our second course and cohort launching in October. So lots of time to really look into these programs and see if it's something you'd like to pursue. So Circus Stream is also one of the few educators in the space offering XR industry-specific certifications. But again, more on that later. And you know, who have we had the pleasure to, to upscale and teach and really help train and, and learn the skills to develop and design for the metaverse and XR? Well, we have people joining us from all walks of life, from large enterprises right down to the individual learner, from you know, Raytheon, VMware, Nike, Twitter, YouTube, Snap, uh, various post-secondary institutions and schools. Uh, as well as Walmart and even Hershey's the chocolate company because mm, that chocolate's going to be delicious. You better believe it. Now, one other thing I want to touch up on and that I'm also excited to share is that we here at Circus Stream have been partnering with some of the most well-recognized educational institutions in the world. And our XR development and design programs are now even more accessible to learners through our university partners. So if you are in any of these local geos, do feel free to check it out. You will get a university certificate alongside Circuit Stream certificate when completing these programs. So do check it out. Maybe your local university and school will offer Circuit Stream courses, if not now, in the future. Now, we love working and alongside industry thought leaders and having them best prepare our learners for the future of work. And this is just some of our curriculum advisory board members that I wanted to share with you all today. Kirsten from Tailspin, Patricia IBM, Rick from Unity, Aletha, the author of UX for XR Toolkit, Jeremy at Accenture, Joey at Meta, and so many others that I didn't add here, BMW, Oracle, we try and get all of the industries, leaders, thought leaders, experienced people to give us insights on how to better prepare our learners for the future of work. Now, a little bit about the industry trends and growth. I love this one by Pricewaterhouse, seeing is believing report in 2019. They mentioned 23.5 million jobs worldwide will be using augmented and virtual reality by 2030 for training, collaboration, and to provide new digital experiences. Now, the metaverse represents a potential 8 trillion to 13 trillion opportunity by 2030 as well, and could boast as many as 5 billion users. And this was from Citibank, Metaverse and Money, Decrypting the Future, published maybe a month or so ago, it, it, it very, very recent, but this is just a show, you know, tip of the iceberg. There's so much growth here for metaverse technologies and VR and AR. And 
We're super excited to be a part of it, to help people get the skills to be able to, you know, continue being successful in the industry or pivot with a career in the industry here. And, you know, what industries uh, are embracing this technology? As I mentioned earlier, and as we see in the poll, so many industries you can apply this to. And I'm sure Jeremy will touch up on this later on. But from media and entertainment, retail, architecture, military, automotive, fashion, healthcare, education, and manufacturing, when so many other ones out there are embracing this, investing in the technology, exploring this technology, and very excited to see and have, uh, have Jeremy share, you know, what clients or use cases he's helping share more on the metaverse and whatnot. Now, some geographic trends. Again, we have people today on this webinar from all over the world. And that's just that. People all over the world are looking into this and investing in this technology and interested in AR and VR. And as you can see here on this little tiny picture that I probably should have made bigger, um, you know, it's just growing exponentially, you know, by by if not 100% down to that 75% marker or so. But it's growing. There's so much room to grow. The trends, everything is looking great. So it's a wonderful time to learn more about the metaverse, VR and AR, and how to be involved within it. Now, I'm going to share a quick two-minute video here just to really show you some of the immersive technologies use cases. It's two minutes long. I'm going to share this video right away here. And as soon as the video wraps up, I'm going to be slowly introducing Jeremy onto the stage here. So here it goes. The world is changing. And the dawn of new technologies has begun. Immersive technologies. Yeah. Future made today. Ah, uh, amazing! Gives me the shiver. Gives me the shivers just to see how you can apply this technology to so many different activities, roles, initiatives, and whatnot. But yes, I did see a lot of comments here in the chat. Is this recorded? Will that video I just shared be included in the recording? Yes, it will be. This is all recorded. We'll send it out to all the registrants. And uh, this video that I just shared will be included within it as well. But learning XR skills is an advantage. Uh, Hire.com shared that there was 1,400% AR VR job growth in 2020, 601% to 
demand growth for real-time 3D skills and 122% demand for proficiency with 3D engines expected to grow in the next 10 years. Now with that, I would love to invite Jeremy Dalton onto the stage here. Again, Jeremy leads PwC's Metaverse Technologies teams. He's been featured in the Financial Times, The Economist, the BBC, and other media outlets. He has worked with organizations like the World Economic Forum and currently sits on the advisory board of Immerse UK, a government-backed cross-sector industry body that supports the growth of immersive technologies. Jeremy, thank you again for joining us. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you here today. Thank you again. Steph, the pleasure is all mine and I'm really appreciative of everyone's time here. So thanks so much for, for being here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a back, background on me and the sort of work I'm doing. Sure. And then great. I'll give you a little bit of a brief um, run through some of the, the misconceptions of, of XR technology. It was one of my favorite parts of Reality Check that I enjoyed writing. And uh, to be honest with you, I would be very interested just in understanding what everybody is interested in talking about. And then we can go in that direction. So I don't necessarily have a, uh, a fixed presentation for you. So I'm not going to just speak at you for the next 30, 40 <laughs> minutes. Uh, what we'll do is I'll get you, I'll give you some information that will hopefully whet the appetite a little bit, and then we can go in whatever direction you want. So all I'm asking is um, just let me know what you, what you want to hear more about. If there's something I'm saying that you're particularly interested in, then it's not a problem at all. Let me know in the chat and we can dig in that direction even further. And yeah, let's make it a, an interactive, fun conversation. And hopefully uh, you'll find something interesting in it. <laughs> Perfect. That sounds great to me, Jeremy. Uh, for everyone in the audience here today, toss uh, what would you like to hear into the chat? If you do have questions, however, toss them into the questions tab. This is the perfect opportunity to not only pick my brain and some of the Circus Stream team's brain, but to have Jeremy Dalton answer some of your questions. So do toss them into the questions tab. What do you want to hear about today? Toss them into the chat. But maybe, Jeremy, maybe to kick things off, tell us a little bit about Reality Check, because I know it's aimed at non-technical professionals and business leaders who are interested in learning more about this yeah, incredible absolutely, world. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I wrote Reality Check because when I, as I've been talking to business leaders across all different industries, it became very clear that there was a lack of understanding about the business value of the technology. So everybody thought it was just a gaming technology. And don't get me wrong, like I, I play video games. I'm a video gamer myself and video games in virtual reality are great fun. But it does have a lot of very serious business applications. And uh, I think those are not they're not portrayed as well as the more consumer facing world of games. And for that reason, I wanted to try and break a number of misconceptions about this technology and bring to light the fact that this is used in, in every single industry out there right now and for a number of different business purposes from remote collaboration to soft skills training, as you saw, practical okay. skills training, remote assistance. It's being used to analyze consumer behaviors. There are just so many different areas and it's it was really exciting. Uh, and I needed to be able to, to just package up all of that thinking and put it into a book. And that's what Reality Check ended up being. Perfect. Lovely. I, I enjoyed the read as well. I, I recommend to everyone to check out his book, Reality Check. We're going to share the links throughout this talk and at the very end as well. Um, but uh, anything from the chat that you see here, Jeremy, I did see something that I can bring up if, if there's nothing that, that you'd want to do. What I'll do is um, I'll just bring up a, uh, a slide deck about the misconceptions and that might sure. stir some, some interesting thoughts from the audience. Perfect. Let's do that. So let's see. Can everyone see that? Yep. Misconceptions of XR. Perfect. Okay. Let me see if I, oh, excellent. I can move along. Right. So the first misconception that, um, uh, that I think is worth mentioning is that virtual reality is not actually a new technology. It's been around for a very long time, right? And if you want to go, you can go back many, many years, but I'm going to stop myself in the late 1700s before I go too crazy. And in the late 1700s, this is an illustration, because obviously we didn't have cameras back then, of Leicester Square in London. 
and it was a it was a building a, a sort of cylindrical building called the panorama rotunda and this opened up in 1793 and as you can see from the picture there the idea was you know you paid your your few shillings or whatever it was to enter and you went up these stairs and you came across this balustrade and you leaned over and you looked across this beautiful vista of um, this this lake with uh, boats sailing in the distance, mountains, hillsides, and it just gave you immersion into this completely different world. And the funny thing is, that is exactly what we're trying to do right now with virtual reality technology, just using a different means to achieve that, a more electronic digital means rather than this very sort of physical, non-digital way of presenting that information. Skipping a little bit ahead to 1849, so David Brewster was a, Scot was a Scottish scientist and he invented a new type of stereoscope. So this wasn't actually the first stereoscope on the market, but uh, this was the one that most closely aligns with virtual reality headsets that we know and love nowadays. I imagine we all love them here given that we're on uh, <laughs> on this webinar. So, uh, so David Brewster invented this portable type that's very similar to VR headsets we've got. And the idea was, instead of having a screen in front of those lenses that gave you a different picture in each eye, you had a physical piece of card with two pictures. And that slotted in to the back of the, um, the uh, stereoscope. And uh, you looked through the lenses and each picture got seen by, uh, by each eye. And that type of that technology or that idea of stereoscopic vision is very much the same concept that we use nowadays in virtual reality hardware, so which is pretty amazing. So even the most cutting edge virtual reality hardware on the market still uses this very same, very human concept of delivering a different image to each eye. And yeah, David uh, Jumo was saying in the 70s, the Viewmaster. If anyone's interested, actually, I am going to, I'm going to reveal my background. It's a little bit messy, um, but this is my actual, this is, <laughs> this is my non-metaverse environment. Uh, hold on a minute, one second. I think it went back for, uh, there we go. Can you see my background now? Yep, uh, we see with the headsets behind you. Yeah, there you go. Yep. I'll give you a little bit of a tour about what's going on here. So you've got um, headsets from many different years <laughs> across the shelves here, um, including uh, that one there that my head just covered. So uh, that one, that's actually from 1993, the VFX-1. Um, yeah, the Virtual Boy from 1995. I noticed uh, some people had uh, had seen of course, reality check, you know, is on the shelf as well. A um, load of different sort of glasses and displays. You've got Google Glass at the front there. You've got Snapchat spectacles that are not technically augmented reality devices, but I think they, um, they're they part of the, the sort of development around AR and the connections of the real world. So I, I keep them in my collection anyway. This headset here is a particularly interesting one. And uh, this is actually... As far back as I could go, this is the headset that actually made it onto the consumer market first. It's called the Victor Max Stuntmaster. And uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a very basic virtual reality headset. Some would argue it's not even virtual reality, but I'm, I'm kind of stretching the definition here by, I would describe it as an immersive viewer. So it doesn't actually have the ability to track your movement but it gives you a very large screen effectively that you can be immersed in so in some ways i think it still counts as a virtual reality device further up you've got uh, items you'll recognize the oculus quest the very first version of the samsung gear vr um the now defunct meta so before facebook was called meta there was meta <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then you've got the Oculus Go, you've got the HTC Vive Pro, um, and yeah, there's there's loads of other stuff. I mean, it it goes back for many many years. Oh, and someone, sorry, the reason I opened up my camera in the first place, someone mentioned uh, Viewmaster, Dave Jumeau, and uh, here you go, Dave. These are two Viewmasters. 
And in fact, that one is the very first Viewmaster that was ever made. So um, you can see it there. And the idea was you'd, you'd slot in these circular discs inside the middle there, and you'd view them through uh, those two lenses there. Now, if everyone looks closely, you'll see like it has a speckled sort of appearance. Yep. Those speckles are asbestos. So, yes, the, uh, <laughs> the, the toxic substance. <laughs> so, basically, if you take that, you put it on your face, you're basically shoving asbestos into your face. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only, I'm only um, teasing, of course, because it is, it is asbestos. I'm not joking about that. Right. But the, um, the, the asbestos is actually baked into the plastic so that it's not actually dangerous. It can't, those fibers can't enter your lungs. Mm -hmm. um, but it is an interesting trivia point that I like to bring up. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that is a little tour of the, uh, the virtual reality museum I hope to uh, start at one day. Um, I've also got, if anyone's interested, and we can talk more about this later, but I won't, I won't bore you with this stuff for too much longer. Uh, I've got uh, original press photos of uh, virtual reality and augmented reality throughout the ages and uh this one is probably one of my favorites here uh -huh. um, if everyone can see that it's a real picture that came from the press um and i'll read the caption for you the caption says john chisholm left chief executive of the defense agency uh, and the virtual reality headset being tested all right <laughs> and uh, if you look at the date, the date says 24th of October, 1991. So there you wow. go. So even back now. then. <laughs> yeah, 22, we're 2022, so 22 plus 9. Yeah, over 30 years ago, that photo was taken. Just so, just goes to show, you know, how, how long this technology has been around, but now more, you know, consumer friendly and more affordable and you know you're not carrying around these, oh yeah these massive things with with yourself right in, in the 90s you would have to for a virtual reality experience that could be considered good quality you'd have to put down in the consumer days actually in fact i have this in the presentation now let me bring that up uh yes in the consumer ages we had uh, we had a company that came out of leicester in the uk for anyone who's um, who's in the UK, and I know there are a few here, uh, it was called W Industries, and they started a division or a set of virtual reality head-mounted displays or systems called Virtuality, and those came onto the market to much delight initially of uh, the people, and uh, then unfortunately <laughs> it made a lot of people feel sick, which uh, which wasn't great. And uh, that was kind of the reason why virtual reality as a, as a technology took a bit of a nosedive in the in the 90s. And I see people talking about some uh, some great uh, uh, old school movies there. The Lawnmower Man, Johnny Mnemonic. Yep. These were all movies that were born out of the hype of the 90s when people got super excited, much like we're getting very excited right now uh, about the potential of this technology and what it can do. The only difference, though, with what we have now that we didn't have back then is processing power. Mm -hmm. Now, back then, this these systems, the virtuality systems you're seeing on the screen here, they were running on, probably best not to quote me on this, but they are Atari processors. So if I remember correctly, I think it was two Atari 2600 processors. Or what was the Atari um, up from that? Was it the Atari 3600? Yeah, it might have been two Atari 3600 processors that were trying to desperately run these uh, these virtual reality systems, um, which was uh, which was a really tough call, really tough call. If anyone is curious about trying this uh, these hardware out, some of it is still available. And in fact, I'd like to sh to give a shout out to the uh, Retro Computer Museum in Leicester that is still running four of these machines to this date. And I've actually been there and I've tried not only full six degrees of freedom virtual reality on these devices uh -huh. that were created back in the early 90s, but networked as well. So multiplayer, six DOF, full immersion virtual reality in 1991, which is wow. absolutely amazing if you think about it. 
Uh, don't get me wrong, though. There are downsides to this. The graphics are horrendous by modern day standards. Mm -hmm. And the lag is so bad that even myself, and I've been in virtual reality a lot, I've been in all sorts of applications, good and bad. I, I did feel incredibly nauseous on the train ride back to London from Leicester. So um, just be prepared for that. It's an experience worth having, though, for those of you who are interested. Consider it a pilgrimage of sorts for the uh, <laughs> for the VR initiates uh, initiates among us. No, that's great. It's it's great to see you know how it's kind of transitioned and how, even seeing your collection, you know, from from the technologies and the devices back in the day to today, um, you know how they've transformed. One thing I wanted to ask you, Jeremy, is you know, how has XR transformed businesses and how can it transform businesses today? Sure. I'll I'll tackle that in just a second, Steph. I sure, of course. No screen. worries. I'd love to learn more. So Janice is asking about um, VR sickness and it being manifested differently in women. Mm -hmm. If you're interested in that concept, I actually researched it quite a bit for Reality Check. And there is a specific section in Reality Check that covers uh, VR sickness and where it's coming from, what the factors are involved. And the point you make, I also talk about there, to summarize for everyone, um, and I'm, I'm going off memory here, but there are three different sort of factors or groups of factors that can cause virtual reality sickness. And the first one is to do with the hardware itself. So the hardware has to be good enough to run the software at a performance level that doesn't make the system lag and therefore doesn't create a, um, a lag between when you move your head and when the scene moves. If that happens, that sort of feeling is, is the same sort of feeling, or the theory is it's the same feeling you get when you've ingested something poisonous, and hence your body rejects it in the same way that it would do if you had ingested something poisonous, so you feel nauseous. Now, so that's hardware, that's one grouping. And that was the issue we had in the 90s. Hardware wasn't at a good enough level to, to run the software, which, which itself wasn't even that great in by modern day uh, standards um, at a level that was uh, that was a good enough performance to stop that nausea from from uh, from coming up. Right. So the second thing is the software. So if you create software where the, the and this might be interested to you, those of you who are involved in uh, in the user experience or the development side of virtual reality and interested in going into that. If you create software in virtual reality that starts sending the camera on a wild sort of winding path when the user is not even moving, that can be a problem because then you've got that same sort of um, disconnection between what you're seeing and what you're feeling. You're feeling like you're on static ground, you're, see you're seated or standing, but um, <laughs> your, your view of what, you're, of what you're seeing is just going all over the place. So software is the second one. The third one, the third grouping of, of issues uh, that can cause VR sickness is actually around the human being uh, it's, uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. So this is the one area that we can't really control. And when we talk about the human being, we're actually talking about so many different factors. We're talking about, um, we're talking about let's say, the amount of sleep you've had. We're talking about the... Uh, what you what you ate. We're talking about um, whether you you know your age. We're talking about your previous exposure to the technology. Whether you've had any negative experiences previously. Your susceptibility to migraines. Uh, your personality. And uh, interestingly enough, so this goes back to the point, Janice, that we were talking about. Um, even a user's menstrual cycle so their hormonal cycle that will impact on how how sick or not they feel when using virtual reality so the summary of all of this basically is you cannot eliminate virtual reality 100 percent. there will always be people who do not feel well in virtual reality and the thing is that is not something that is specific to vr if you go back in time motion sickness as a concept has has been present throughout the ages. And, and don't get me wrong, motion sickness is not exactly the same as virtual reality sickness or cyber sickness, but it shares the same sort of um, uh, starting point and symptoms. So if we go back uh, more than 2000 years ago, the Greek physician Hippocrates 
first described such symptoms when he wrote that sailing on the sea proves that motion disorders the body. And the word nausea itself is actually derived from nause, the Greek word for ship. And that's a testament to the potent effect of seafaring on the human physiology. For the, uh, the British and the crowd, during the 18th century, Lord Nelson, the famous British naval commander, he suffered from seasickness throughout his entire 30-year naval career. <laughs> and uh, so it's just, uh, it's not something that uh, is, you should feel bad about if that does happen to you. It's 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 just the it's an unfortunate fault with human beings <laughs> let's put it that way <laughs> and thank you so much janice i'm actually reading directly from my book so whenever you see the light shine in my face that's basically because i'm opening up a, a pdf version of the book on my screen <laughs> to be able to read to you from um so yeah this is so that's vr sickness now to steph's point uh, your question was around the business usage of the technology right steph yeah, so we've kind of seen how the you know the devices have changed over the years and how they've transformed. So I was curious to know how have you know these uh, devices and XR in general transformed business and how can they transform business today? Yeah, so let's um, let me see. I might have in this presentation a little bit of a good starting point to talk about. These are all. Oh, here we go. This is what I'm looking for. These are all misconceptions, but I'll I can talk <laughs> a bit more about them. Let's start with with this one here. So does anyone recognize which company or which industry uh, this picture is from? Let's see. Yeah, let's see if there's any chat activity. Eric's typing. I mean, the industry should be oh, a bit yeah. easier. Yeah. <laughs> yes, automotive, automotive. <laughs> let's go for a harder question. <laughs> what, uh, what company do you think this is? We know it's an automotive company. It's a car company. What? Uh, yeah, Dale's got it instantly right. Boom. It is Ford. It is Ford. Yeah. VW, a good second guess, though. Uh, so Ford have been using virtual reality since the early 2000s. And uh, this picture is from around that time. I think this picture is taken in the mid 2000s. The idea here is that one of their industrial athletes, as they're called, is in a is in basically a new sort of system for producing a new vehicle that's about to come onto the uh, onto the market. But in order to produce that sort of conveyor belt or that manufacturing line for this vehicle, you have to optimize it. But you don't want to disrupt your current activities in your current production line, because obviously that leads to, to a reduction in revenue. So what you do is you go into virtual reality and you practice it there and you do all the movements that you want to do. And the ergonomics team is uh, is analyzing this behind the scenes. So they're analyzing the strains on the human body every time you lift, you know, a transmission and try and put it into place in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're then on, they're then trying to understand how can we optimize this. So from a health and safety perspective, it is the most sort of uh, safe, sort of ergonomically, um, uh, sort of optimal production or sort of manufacturing line that you can produce and when they've reached that level they will then bring that into the real world so they'll come out of virtual reality and reproduce that production line and then you'll have a tested production line that was that was that was done in virtual reality that was able to avoid uh the disruption to the existing production line so that's an early early example of virtual reality uh, a few other ones that i will mention let's go into here Here's one from an augmented reality side of things. And if anyone's interested in this, actually, you can try this technology out right now. I will, uh, I'll give you a link shortly to check it out. But uh, this is from a Chinese company called Poison. And they work with a British German company called Viking on the technology side of things. That's V-Y-K-I-N-G. Uh, on their app, you've got your normal listings of the shoes. And you can click a button and then it goes it opens up the camera on your phone, you point it at your feet, and it, in, and it sort of slots on the digital version of those shoes, fully three-dimensional, and locks it onto your feet. So you can move your feet, you can look around, you can see it from different angles, and you can get an idea about how those shoes look on you without actually having to go to a store and in a super convenient way, because you can do it anywhere. Yeah. And uh, the wonderful thing about this is it's it leads to real business benefits. So what Poison found after implementing this uh, technology is that they saw a three times increase 
in the conversion rates of people who are willing to add an item to their trolley after experiencing this in augmented reality versus just seeing it on a 2D screen. Yeah, so Elliot's talking about this. This, this same concept is, is there for furniture as well. The whole idea of being able to test physical items in your, sorry, test items in your physical space virtually, um, you, can, you can definitely do that using this technology. And uh, so IKEA is one, one proponent of that. You can use this for sunglasses. Michael Kors have used it for sunglasses. You can use it for watches. Tissot have done that, used augmented reality for that. You can use it for makeup. Sephora, L'Oreal have all been involved. Amazon, absolutely. Dale's right. If anyone's in the UK, PC World, uh, Curry's, they've, been, they've used augmented reality as well. There are so many different vendors now. You don't hear about it a lot, but it, the technology has become so uh, adopted that all of these mainstream brands are using the tech to display and better sell items to consumers. Right. So, yeah, there's other stuff as well. So augmented reality. I know there are a few people from Canada here. This, oh, I can't remember which city in Canada this is from, I'm afraid. But uh, if anyone can, can tell from the picture there, let me know. But this is a city in Canada uh, where a company, it's a Canadian company called Promark Telecom, and they specialize in utilities location. Um, basically, they help companies like construction firms and things like that understand where exactly the underground infrastructure is. And the reason you would do that is because you want to avoid hitting a gas pipe when you're digging up the road, right? Because right. not only can that not be fun, but it can actually be very dangerous. And there have been deaths in the past through utility strikes. Uh, but yeah, Promark Telecom used a, a company called um, Viges, and Viges provided the technology here, which you're seeing. The bottom right-hand side of this slide is their... Um, is their application through a HoloLens uh, augmented reality headset. Do I have the HoloLens here? I do indeed. <laughs> there you go. So uh, the HoloLens 2. And uh, yeah, so the Vija software runs on that. And the idea is you have a, a utility locator that can put on this head, this, uh, head mounted display and uh, they can see in front of them exactly what's going on in the road in front. So they can tell where all the gas pipes are, where all the electrical lines are. And the reason you would do that is because it's you're likely to result in, in far less misunderstandings if you do it through augmented reality than if you do it through uh, a paper diagram, as you can see on the top. Mm -hmm. Because look at the paper, and you've then got to do a, a translation. Well, first of all, you've got to work out what line is what. Which one's the gas line? Which one's the electric line? Where am I? Which road am I on? And then you've got to work out, okay, so if I'm exactly there, then I think the the, the line should be here. So there's a lot of mental effort that has to go on in, in doing all those steps, whereas you just put this on, flip the visor, and there it is, right there. It's, it's immediately just visually clear. So that's another really interesting use case that a lot of people don't talk about, but I find very interesting and very useful in the world. Right. We talked about the Ford example. This is, uh, a lot of people will argue with me here, but I still think this is a form of augmented reality. La Liga, if anyone is a football fan or soccer fans for anyone uh, in the States, uh, La Liga ran uh, empty, as, as did many countries, empty stadium football matches during the pandemic. Uh, but in order to present a familiar experience back home, they used augmented reality to superimpose the crowd visually uh, into the into the uh, the match itself, and they even used uh, sounds. So, from an audible perspective, they also got <laughs> sounds off uh, Electronic Arts, the gaming company, who, if I'm not mistaken, actually originally uh, got their sounds from real football stadiums and then in a funny turn of events <laughs> offered those sounds back to La Liga <laughs> to be able to produce this familiar experience during the pandemic which is quite an amusing example and then last one I'll mention uh, Steph and then we can go on to some other topics that people find interesting uh, this is a screenshot from an, a virtual reality application produced by the Red Cross or the International Committee for the Red Cross I should say the ICRC 
<laughs> and uh, they have a, a dedicated virtual reality team of about 12 people. And this was the last time I spoke to them anyway, so they might even have more by now. Um, and the idea here is that they use virtual reality to help um, acclimatize different people to challenging environments in a safe way. And they've also worked from a forensic perspective to help train different forces around the world. So they actually worked with the Thai government to help them uh, learn skills on how to manage a disaster, the fallout of a, of a natural disaster. So let's say, uh, let's say a tsunami hit or a hurricane hit, and you've got, you know, just chaos everywhere. You've got bodies you need to identify. There is obviously a procedure that needs to be done on that, and there's best practice and so on. Uh, that can be that can be practiced in virtual reality. So they produced applications like that to help uh, the uh, the Thai police forces in general. So yeah, there are a few examples for you, and uh, I, we can go on to other subject areas. So we can talk about three hundred and sixty video if anyone's interested in that. We can talk about VR adoption. Uh, what else have we got about? Yeah, we've talked a little bit about it not being for gaming and entertainment. VR versus AR. Uh, not just headsets. So yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of interesting stuff. If anyone has a preference, just let me know in the chat, and we can go the direction you want. Well, one thing that I did notice, you know, coming through the chat and some of the questions in the questions tab um, are, you know, and we kind of went through some of the uh, use cases already, but some XR opportunities for people entering XR in the metaverse today. And for instance, I just saw you go through entertainment could be an opportunity yeah. for people entering. Absolutely. Well, the, the thing I'd like to say to everyone is that virtual reality and augmented reality have applications in every single industry. doesn't matter what industry you, met, you name, I can find you a real life example of it already being used in that industry. Right. So there are just opportunities everywhere for this, this sort of technology. It's just not widely spoken about as much as, let's say, uh, the consumer market, the entertainment market. So that's quite an obvious one, but the the potential of this tech goes far beyond that. Right, definitely, I agree. And what about the the different roles of XR professionals that play, uh, you know, a part in all these different opportunities and in immersive industries? Yeah, so I talk about this uh, briefly in Reality Check, and uh, the way I see it, there's three uh, basic sort of groupings of skill sets when it comes to XR. And that is the business side, the creative side and the technological side. So from a business perspective, you're looking at stuff like stakeholder management, program management, uh, project management and uh, change management, all the managements. <laughs> uh, when it comes to the creative side, you're looking at things like 3D modeling, 3D animation, user experience design, um, user interface design. Uh, you're looking at potentially sound design as well, script writing, depending right. on the use case. Uh, there's a lot of stuff there that's really interesting. You've got graphic design, um, you've got texture artistry. I think there are a lot of really interesting areas to dig into on the creative side. And then you've got the technological side. And this is the side that I think a lot of people have a uh, uh, or hear most about. And this is more to do with the the programming side of things, the QA side of things, or quality assurance testing side of things. So this would be Unity development, C sharp development, um, shader programming, uh, shader code, which uh, I, I don't go near. <laughs> I hear I hear about it. I hear about it whispered in dark corners, but uh, yeah, no, I don't get too involved in that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Perfect. Now, w there's one comment here uh, or, or note in, in the chat I'd love to bring up. And then, you know, I'll quickly wrap up, you know, my slides and then we'll open up for Q&A because I did yeah. see a lot of questions in the questions tab. I'd love to get to. And, and you let me know, Jeremy, how much time you have. Yeah, um, it's all good. We'll go through the questions take... after you're done. And then, yeah, Perfect. if anyone has any more, feel free to drop them in and I'll uh, try and answer them after this. Lovely. So we have one here from Danilo, and uh, Danilo is one of our alumni, a creative director at Vodafone, if I'm not mistaken. And he, he's curious to know uh, about your insights and thoughts on adoption from your perspective, both from brand and consumer side. What, what do you have there? Yeah. So the problem with trying to understand adoption from a corporate perspective is that there's not enough really good data on that, to be honest, because right. organizations are not 
uh, they're not just opening up about what they how they're using virtual reality and augmented reality. We did kind of get around this, and uh, I don't know if you're a quick question, Steph, before I potentially reveal or not reveal. <laughs> this. But I know this is being recorded. Are you releasing this publicly, like, or is it going to the people in here only? It, it, it will be the people here for sure. We do typically post it on YouTube as well, but let us know if, uh, if, if there's something secretive <laughs> that you're sharing. Well, there is we... something secretive that I need removed <laughs> if you do want to put it on YouTube. Oh, sure. Not a problem. <laughs> okay. Okay. In that case, let me see if I can open this up. Uh, where is this? Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. Um, okay. I think this is it. Basically, what I'm going to show you is an analysis that we conducted in order to get around this issue that, you know, not every company is talking about, or, or let's say uh, it's difficult to talk to all of these companies and get all of that information. What we wanted to do is try and understand if we scan publicly available records out there. So in other words, if we look at annual reports, if we look at social media, uh, if we look at... Um, uh, let's say, different news postings from these companies, and we try and scan using a, a natural language processing algorithm when virtual reality, augmented reality is being used, uh, when uh, terms like immersive technology, spatial computing, all of those are being mentioned, and then and then getting, a, getting a, the computer to assess whether this company is just talking about it or whether they actually have a whether they're using it um, and then for those that are using it we pull them into this analysis and uh, assess how they're using it what industry they're coming from where they're based all this sort of stuff so that's the that's the analysis we did and we ended up we ended up scraping about if i remember correctly it was about 15 million companies across the us and the uk which is where we started and uh and then we um this is the and this is the result that we, we came across that I'm going to show you now. So I did find the while I was talking, I managed to find the URL that we're talking about here. So uh, for the edit that goes on YouTube, this is the part that uh, that we cut out. Hopefully that provides a little bit of interesting insight on that question. Uh, and to just to end the answer, the consumer side, I think that there's just a lot more data on the consumer side. Um, and I think you can find that from various analysts who have different views on headset sales and everything from headset sales to the market size to the economic value. There's just different uh, ways of understanding its impact in the consumer world. Right. That makes sense. Oh, Jeremy, loved everything you shared here. Now, we have so many questions in the questions tab that I would love to get through. And if you've got the time, would love to have you sure. uh, join and answer some of those. But before I get into there, I do want to wrap up these slides here. Audience, I'm going to take five minutes of your time to wrap things up, and then we'll open it up for Q&A with Jeremy here. I'll be I've back then with you, Steph. Yeah, take your time, Jeremy. No rush at all. Five minutes. I'll be right back, um, or you'll be right back to, to share it. But Jeremy, thank you so much for that incredible presentation and the insights you shared. Now, hang on, folks. Don't leave just yet. I'm just going to offer you uh, some next steps for those interested in learning more of these skills to build for the metaverse. Five minutes, I'll invite Jeremy back on stage for the Q&A session here as well. But if you're interested in following Jeremy, I'm going to toss this at the end uh, as well. But let me pull up the... Uh, actually, I'll, I'll share the links afterwards. But if you're interested in following Jeremy, his website, jeremydaltonxr.com, you can follow him and connect with him on LinkedIn, Jeremy Dalton, and Twitter, Jeremy Dalton XR. So please don't hesitate to follow Jeremy. He is traveling the world, sharing his knowledge, insights, and expertise to so many people like yourselves here today. Now, again, Jeremy touched up on a lot of these careers, and there's so many careers for the metaverse, real-time 3D industry, XR, from XR development and design, game development and design using engines like Unity and Unreal, 3D artistry and graphics, simulations engineers, UX designers, uh, composers and sound designers, as Jeremy mentioned, and so much more. Maybe your role has not even been created yet. Um, so 
there are so many opportunities for, for all of you to continue growing into or even to pivot into. And if this is something that is of interest to you, we'd love to have you with us in one of our courses and programs here at Circus Stream. Uh, if you're more so interested on the technical side of things, programming, coding, the XR development course is for you. May 17th is our next cohort, 10 weeks long, all live and online, instructor led uh, with, um, with our team here, daily support, three hours of live class instruction with five hours of additional support each and every week. Uh, so if you wanna become a developer, a programmer, if you're a manager, a leader, wanna understand what your teams are working on and how to speak to them, XR development is the course for you. If you're a designer or if you're interested in moving into 3D design, interaction design to prototype, storytelling for XR, the interaction design and prototyping for XR is for you. July 13th is the next program, 10 weeks long. Similarly, three hours of live class instruction with daily open office hours for additional support. A wonderful community, David Jumeau here, so many others who are joining us on this workshop and webinar that you can network with and collaborate with. So if you're interested in building for the metaverse, learning more Unity skills, developing and designing for VR and AR, please do check out one of the courses and programs here. We've got a great community on Slack, building a Discord, daily open office hours, events, coffee hours, show and tell, demo days, game jams, local meetups, speaker events with XR companies and you know leaders like Jeremy here today. We would love to have you with us. So if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have students joining us from all walks of life. Lee Walker with Kaleidoscope XR. Now Tenny, who went from Facebook to co-founding his own business. Andrew Alderetti, the man, Cine Concerts XR developer. And a lot of our students get accepted into Oculus's Launchpad program. Jennifer Swan in 2020, Aileen in 2021, who's next in 2022, and then even Tara going from WeWork to Unity Technologies afterwards. So if you're interested, check it out, the XR development or the XR design course, start at 3950. If you want to include a C-sharp course and 10 hours of one-on-one -on -one sessions and support with one of our instructors, it's 4950 for the plus package. We do offer payment plans. Uh, in-house here at Circuit Stream for international folks outside of the U.S., three, six, 12-month payment plans. Uh, or if you're in the U.S., Climb Credit offers flexible payment plans and loans as well, and you can apply them through, through there as well. Now, if you're interested in learning more about the XR development course and program, do join our open house on May 5th, starting at the same time as this webinar started today, 12 p.m. Pacific. May 5th, again, open house XR developments with Unity. Um, we actually have a very special announcement here. Uh, Immerse, also based out of the UK, was gracious enough to provide and contribute uh, $5,000 for scholarships for any people who want to become XR developers and creators. So, they are offering five $1,000 scholarships for anyone joining the open house and who is interested in registering for our uh, next XR development cohort. So do join us there to learn more about the course and program. Attendees will be selected for the uh, Immerse scholarship. Thank you, Immerse. For, for your contribution to help bring more creators into this world. So if you're interested, do check it out, May 5th, 12 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we'd love to chat with you. If, you're, if you've got questions about the technology, the courses, the programs, want to learn more about Circus Stream, please reach out to our admissions team. We would love to speak with you and help you out. Now, if you're interested, download a syllabus or apply now through one of our university partners or through circuitstream.com slash learning. We'll share this with you all afterwards as well. But again, Jeremy Dalton's book, I highly, highly recommend you get it. Where's mine? Mine's probably still in my bedside table after I finished reading it. But realitycheckxr.com, check out his book, highly recommend it. Uh, 
I learned so many things even after working in the industry for, for more than two years. So I do suggest you checking it out. Um, we'll be announcing the giveaway winners of the 10 copies we're giving out next Tuesday by email. So super excited for that there. Again, if you're interested in following Jeremy, check out his website. His LinkedIn, Twitter, screenshot this page if you would like, uh, or my team backstage will we'll share with you all. But Jeremy, would love to invite you back onto the stage here. Five minutes. I hope it took five minutes. Apologies <laughs> if, it, if it went a little longer. But I do want to get through these questions. Jeremy, thanks again for joining me. I appreciate it. No worries. No worries at all. So, so I've been having a look at some of the questions and some really great questions there. Um, as I said, uh, just upvote the ones you're really interested in. So if you That's go into it. the questions box on the bottom right, uh, click on that. It will open up all the questions, have a look through them, and click the uh, the little number on the left-hand side <laughs> if you want to upvote that question. And uh, if it rises to the top, uh, hopefully we'll have time to answer it. But the starting with the highest ranking one by Georgia Clegg, That's how it. should creative people... Uh, VFX artists, designers, animators, etc., be upskilling if they want to move into the fastest growing areas of VR, AR. So, I've been thinking about this, and I've been thinking about the the really exciting areas of virtual reality and augmented reality. And personally, I think that there are two big areas that I mean, I I would concentrate on that I think are really interesting and exciting. One of them is WebXR. And uh, I say that because WebXR is what will um, allow us to create a more scalable way of, of, uh, of experiencing virtual reality and augmented reality top technology in particular. So what I found when talking to clients about augmented reality mobile apps is that uh, nobody wants to create an application anymore, like a dedicated app that you have to download from the App Store. There's just too much friction involved in that. However, if you have web AR, then you can potentially, you can do that just through a through a website, through a link or a QR code, and uh, you can have an, an AR experience. Now, there are pros and cons with it, of course, but um, I think it's a very exciting area that where the, the functionality, even though it's more limited than what you can do in a native app, will will increase as as the technology progresses. So that's one area I think is really interesting to upskill in. And the other one is volumetric capture. So uh, let me see, I actually uploaded a video. And let me see if I can share this with you. Yeah, there we go. So this is an example, this is an application that my team created. Uh, using volumetric capture, um, and it's designed as a diversity and inclusion training program that is being rolled out to the whole of PwC UK. So that's about 24,000 people, um, and it's being used in different territories around the world as well. So uh, I just want to bring you back to some of these scenes. Yeah, so we've got three people in this scene, for example. This these volumetric captures are it's it's incredible because this it looks photorealistic. It's fully three dimensional and yet it can run once it's optimized. Of course, it can run on standalone hardware. So this application was built for the Quest one, which, as many of you probably know, is uh, has a, a processor that is you know basically equivalent to a mobile phone processor at the end of the day. Um, so we were really happy with the results there. In, uh, in bringing this to life. So I think optimization probably as an offshoot of this is another really interesting area to look at. Perfect, love it. And, no worries, uh, so next, yeah, sorry, Steph, you wanna go for it? No worries at all, no worries at all. Yeah, so th that was a great question, Georgia. Thank you very much for asking it. And you're hopping over to the next one, right? Uh, Jeremy, the from, from Swapnil, if I'm not exactly, mistaken. Exactly, exactly. Perfect, so Swapnil's asking, you know, as a business leader, I would like to know various business possibilities with metaverse and blockchain. Where do I start? Where, where does uh, someone start? I was waiting. I was waiting for someone to mention <laughs> the M word. <laughs> so uh, for those of you who are not aware, um, the we used to be called the VR slash AR team. And that's probably why you've got, uh, why you can see my title at the top there as head of AR slash VR. That, that was, those were the olden days. And then we found it got a little bit cumbersome, so we uh, we renamed our team XR, you know, which is uh, uh, you know the title of this talk. It's well recognized in the industry. The only problem is 
that XR is not a recognized or not as recognized a term outside our industry. Also, it's, it shares the same acronym as, uh, as Extinction Rebellion. So uh, we got some odd emails at times. <laughs> and uh, at about, it was about six to nine months ago, we obviously the metaverse was becoming a thing and uh, absolutely we jumped on the bandwagon of the metaverse but also it was a strategic move as well in that we don't our team is not the, called the metaverse team it's called the metaverse technologies team right. and that is very deliberate because we consider the metaverse technologies to be virtual reality augmented reality 3d or virtual world technologies and blockchain uh, mainly and with that remit we can better describe the sort of the wide range of of services and products that we that we uh, that we have on offer and, and propose. So we don't only do stuff that goes on a headset. You know, we do virtual worlds that sit on desktop machines as well. So the term metaverse technologies really is a great encompassing term for us to uh, to have used. But back to um, to Swap's question. We'd like to know various business possibilities with metaverse and blockchain and where to start. So if you're looking at the metaverse, you're going to want to look at virtual reality and augmented reality or XR anyway. So you've heard from Circuit Stream about uh, a lot of the, the courses that they offer. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, uh, but I don't know if uh, Circuit Stream doing anything on blockchain at all, Steph? Not, not at the moment. We're always expanding our course catalog. Cool. I mean, if you want to look at blockchain stuff, you know, there is there are a lot of resources out there. It depends on whether you want. And, and to be honest, they're, they're free resources and there are paid resources out there and they have their pros and cons. So I don't really have any one place I'd recommend to check. I mean, just off the top of my head, um, there is a course by because I, I just saw this today. There is a course by uh, Wharton, the Wharton uh, Business School. Yep. They do a an executive course on economics of blockchain and digital assets so if you're interested in that you know give that a go and, and see if that uh, if that works what do we got next all right well great question swap nil and thank you for for the insights there jeremy uh this one's from tanvir and tanvir is asking for the xr industry which game engine will dominate so i mean i've got some ideas but would love to hear from you as well jeremy sure sure so I think it's pretty clear based on on Unity's headway that they may dominate from a numbers perspective. So it depends on how you're analyzing this. Mm -hmm. If uh, if you're looking at the number of applications that are built on a certain game engine, it's probably going to be Unity. In all honesty, based on his or based on the historical uh, uh, data. However, that doesn't mean it's the best game engine. Exactly. As Morgan says, you know, Unreal Engine come up with some really amazing stuff. Yeah. So uh, and, and I'm, I'm very impressed by Unreal Engine. I think they do some amazing, amazing work and their uh, their revenue share or licensing model is very appealing. Uh, so you can you can enter you can you can join that ecosystem uh, without having to uh, uh, to put down too much cash uh, until you yourself are making a lot of money. So I think there are there are definitely pros and cons for both, and developers have been arguing for eons about which one's better. I I I'm, I'm hedging my bets by saying <laughs> no, none of neither of these are the best. They both have like their benefits and their negatives, but I can't. It just depends on what your use case is really. So what I would do is consider where you're at with what knowledge you have, what sort of industry you're interested in. And uh, and of course, this decision may be taken out of your hands anyway, because you may join an organization if you want to go in that direction, and they may use Unreal or Unity, and, and therefore you will have to use that. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> That's it. And I was going to say the exact same things, right? Numbers, perspective, Unity, you know, it's very flexible. It's got so many different areas you can build for. Unreal is unreal in the graphic side of things and <laughs> really depends what your you know your your goals are what you're building for and as you're saying where you're going to work if you're working for yourself you can use anything you want if you join someone else you know what tech are they working with so many game engines are special in their own uh, in their own little way have you heard of the uh the one by um a toronto-based company if i'm not mistaken metaverse but uh, meta vr 
verse. Oh from, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Alan Smithson's group. Yeah, that's it. Yes, yes. So another great, you know, engine to 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 build metaverse experiences with. Depends what you're looking for, right? Um, but Absolutely. great question. Thank you, thank you for for the insights there as well, Jeremy. Um, next one we've got from Kevin. Kevin's asking, what software hardware companies do you see, Jeremy, as being the leaders within XR? So there are so many, there are so many subsections of software and hardware companies. I think if you're the most, the most basic one, and the one that probably everyone's thinking about when it comes to a uh, to a hardware perspective, is probably the hardware manufacturers. Mm -hmm. So if I were looking at that group, I can tell you, I can tell you who we we use. So we're in contact with uh, HTC. Uh, we've got a number of their uh, Vive Focus 3s. Uh, we're in contact with Pico. We've got a, a number of, we used to have Pico G2 Pros back in the day, which were three DOF headsets. And uh, then we have G2 4Ks now. And we also have, um, we also have Pico Neo 2s and Neo 3s. I think we had a few Pico Neo 2s, but now mostly Neo 3s. Um, so yeah, Pico, very interesting company as well. And actually, HTC, we're starting to look at the Vive Flow as well from a new form factor perspective. So more of the glasses form factor. I think that would be really interesting. And uh, and then finally, of course, uh, we're in close contact with Meta as well. And we have a number of uh, Meta Quest 2s uh, in PwC all over the world. Mm -hmm. So, And I, I will actually mention one more company. Uh, it's a Paris-based company called Lynx, who we think have a yep. lot of potential. And... Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're very excited to see how their headset develops, and we've we've ordered some of their headsets as well, which we're going to check out. Yeah, do do let me know what your thoughts are on the links. I saw they had a big uh, big audience at the Laval uh, conference recently, so curious to know your thoughts there. Um, what about the uh, you know two things that I really love the Vario headsets um for for mixed reality have you have you tried those as well Jeremy? actually yeah sorry steph i should yeah i should mention varios well we do have varios we right. have a vario xr3 um and it is an absolutely amazing device it is, it is <laughs> it's pretty magical <laughs> so uh, yeah no uh the uh the finnish company vario did a great job on that uh, for those who don't know varios xr3 is used by nasa astronauts for training purposes so as far as i can see it is if you want a very high quality headset, then that is that is definitely at the top of the market. Yeah, it is. It is. I With used to call the price range to match that. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> I was going to say I used to call the the Valve Index the Lamborghini and Ferrari of headsets. And now <laughs> Vario's up there as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Mojo Lens, the the contact lens. Are you familiar with that one, Jeremy? As well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've been in touch with Mojo Vision, and uh, yeah, they're doing some really exciting stuff. I think yeah. that that form factor, once you move away from a wearable to a lens, that's going to be a game changer for the industry when it happens. Oh, yeah. Because not everyone not everyone wears glasses, and not everyone wants to wear glasses or wears or wants to wear something on their face and change the way they look. Especially given how uh, you know personal it is. You know, your your face is your kind of initial representation to the world. So I think once you get into the contact lenses and the technology starts to disappear and become more transparent, um, that is, that's going to be a sign for greater adoption because people will be more comfortable. Saying that, of course, sticking a lens in your eye, fairly intrusive procedure in itself. So <laughs> right. that may be an obstacle to overcome when it happens. Yeah, but very excited. Like there's so many things out there that not many people know about, but uh I always, you know, thought it would be super cool to have this contact lens, whether it's you put it in or it's inserted. We'll see how it is. It could, as you're saying, could be very invasive, but this is just great to see where the technology is going. Um, lovely. And then we have one here from Rochelle. Rochelle's asking, Jeremy, who are your mentors and colleagues in the field that you'd recommend they look into? So I think it very much depends on what area you're interested in. But I can name a few people. Uh, one of them, I, I quite, I quite enjoy engaging with, uh, with academia, and uh, and the reason I like that is because they really dig into this technology in a in a deep way that uh, is difficult to do. 
and their their time scales are really large and and they have the time and the inclination to look at this stuff in a very deep way so there is uh worth checking out if you can uh mel slater from uh the university of barcelona he did some uh some research and he's done some research going back many years now into the the value of virtual reality from uh, the perspective be, of being able to tackle unconscious racial bias, for example, and that has a lot of interesting uh, shoot-offs in terms of how virtual reality can uh, impact you psychologically. So I think that is quite, uh, he, he and his work are very interesting to look at. He used to be part of UCL, um, and UCL have done some great research in, in virtual reality as well. You've got people like Anthony Steed there um who else have you got from the academic side in the us you've got jeremy balenson and uh he's done some uh he's done some amazing work that goes back many years he has his own book as well uh which i think i think i i have on the bookshelf there i've got a load of books you haven't seen the other side of my room there's there's a bookshelf with books on it as well <laughs> um if anyone is interested in the the art of or the science of uh stereoscopy then believe it or not and here's a little bit of trivia for you that to take down to the pub queen's guitarist brian may has been involved in the field of stereoscopy for a long time now and he's actually part of the the london stereoscopic company uh so if anyone and i'm not joking by the way if anyone wants to check it out just search wow. brian may london <laughs> stereoscopic company you'll see pictures of him with uh with with one of these stereoscopes and a, and a book i've got some of his books on on stereoscopy back in the victorian era uh, in fact i'll leave you hanging on this one i'm going to literally <laughs> show you brian may holding a uh, a stereoscope just so you can i can prove to you that uh, i'm not pulling your leg so here we go can everyone see that yeah i can see it look at so that there you go i wasn't <laughs> lying to you brian may is into stereoscopes <laughs> here's Ra rachel commenting he's an astrophysicist or something oh, yeah. amazing wow i know yeah who brian may is insane <laughs> so yeah definitely brian may is worth noting <laughs> definitely in uh in that batch of people amazing then we had rochelle also suggest rochelle patterson suggest anthony steed uh, jeremy balenson and we had june lee here Bernard Cress as well to look into, uh, Lisa Thomas Furness, so many, so many uh, great suggestions, and thank you as well, Jeremy, for, yeah. for those. I will. I'll mention actually one more, sure. um, because if anyone's interested in 360 video, there is a there's a 360 video and well virtual reality director that we work with a lot, and uh, her name is Alex Rule, and she okay. actually contributed oh, one of the chapters in Reality Check. So uh, I would definitely recommend checking her out and, and the work she's done. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, so big props to her. I, I'd also say, yeah, familiar with Alex's work. Great person to also follow and look into. That, thank you for sharing that as well, Jeremy. Um, let's see what we got next here. So many, Jeremy, how are you doing on time? Do let me know if, you know, I, I know it's yeah, evening so for yourself. All good. Perfect. Do let me know at, at any moment if you have to leave. But uh, sure. the next upvoted question here and do do upvote the questions for those of you who are still here um as we go through the list i don't think we'll get through them all there's a lot of them but we'll do our very best here um the next one's from dale campbell dale's asking what are your thoughts on vr in film production especially using 3d so probably need clarification dale are you talking about using the medium of virtual reality to experience films or are you talking about the type of technology that was used on the mandalorian to produce regular 2d films mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so david david said the unreal for the mandalorian assuming it's the uh the screens they're using but let's see if uh yeah. dale dale campbell 3d uh, dale is it for viewing films and production in vr so you're talking about a film okay you're talking about a film in which you're in virtual reality in that film environment in a way yes yeah okay. okay got you so i think it is it's an exciting medium and i think it's uh it's a it's a niche subset of the film industry i don't think it's necessarily 
something that will catch on in a massive way, but that doesn't mean it's not going to be significant. I personally find uh, I find the medium very um, very engaging, but not everyone wants to watch films in that way. So my my sort of view on it is a bit tempered in that I think it will it will definitely exist. It has value, but it will not take over and supersede regular film. <laughs> I, I, I like that. I like that. And hopefully that helps Dale. I know he's typing as well. But uh, <laughs> thank you, Jeremy. Uh, we have one here from Aravind. Um, do let us know what you can share. Can share, Jeremy. The question is, what is PwC working on? in? Yeah, Sasha? sure. So uh, we've got a project right now with the NHS in the UK, the National Health Service. And uh, we're we're helping them uh, devise a virtual reality and augmented reality strategy because I saw in the chat earlier a few people talking about XR's use in healthcare, and there is an incredible, you know, a number of applications of XR in healthcare there. Uh, and the NHS knows that, and the NHS is using virtual reality and augmented reality right now in healthcare. So this is very much a discovery exercise to put everything together. Um, and talk about how else it's being used in, in the world and then decide on, on next steps. So that's quite an exciting project. We're working with Coles um, in Australia. That's uh, Australian supermarket chain. I don't know if we have any Aussies in the group, uh, but that's a very exciting project um, that one of the uh, uh, one of the Coles staff members put on LinkedIn uh, a few days ago to talk about. Um, I'll let them talk about exactly what it's about, but uh, it's it's an exciting project we'll hopefully complete in the next month. And uh, we're also working with a company in Dubai called um, M Content, and they have a blockchain based, what I would describe as a platform that is aiming to democratize filmmaking by by funding it through the through um through a through cryptocurrency basically so every time you view or buy or sell an nft relating to the video content on that platform a tax is taken and that and all of those taxes go into a creative collection a collective content fund which which feeds further filmmaking which feeds further uh, taxes and so on and then it's a virtuous cycle so we're helping them uh, with their strategy around integrating uh, their platform into the metaverse and uh, yeah there are a load of other there are a load of other projects i could go on all day but that will hopefully give you <laughs> a little bit of a flavor and uh, i'm afraid with that i have to run steph it's uh, it's 9 30 here i best no be getting ready for, uh, <laughs> for bed soon <laughs> well hey jeremy as always a pleasure and an honor to have you join us here today sharing uh, your insights I appreciate, I appreciate you having me here thank you of course of course and for everyone still here i can't say it enough i strongly recommend you to check out uh, jeremy's book reality check i'm going to share my screen again just so you can all uh check it out the link here uh do buy his book no matter how experienced you are in this industry and area there's something you can take away from it i guarantee it um and again jeremy uh it couldn't have done this without you thank you so much for your insights expertise knowledge that you're sharing here with everyone um for those of you still That's tuned in here yeah, th again thank you jeremy and uh for those of you still tuned in here um thank you so much for sticking around until the very end apologies that we could not get through all the wonderful questions here but we're going to save these questions i'm going to note it down I'm going to get back to them in one way or another. Um, but again, Jeremy, I, I really appreciate your time here today. Thank, thank you, you, Steph. Thanks to the whole uh, Circuit Stream team. It's been really good fun. And uh, thank you all um, for listening and being such an engaging audience. It's been really, uh, it's been really great. I've seen uh, a lot of activity in the chat, a lot of really good questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get through them all. There's, uh, <laughs> there's an insane number, but I really appreciate you, uh, you writing them down and and hopefully, I, I wish you all the best of luck in your your future and desires to be part of the XR industry. I think it's a very exciting space. It's one I've been involved in since about 2014. And um, I, uh, I always discover new things every day. So uh, I, hope, uh, I hope we can all be part of the same exciting community. Thanks, and I see you next so time. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye. Have a good one.